Hello and welcome to part two of the RSET webinar, Satellite Remote Sensing for Agricultural Applications. My name is Sean McCartney and I'm a scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. In part two of the webinar series, we'll be focusing on soil moisture for agricultural applications. In part one of the webinar series, we provided a history of Earth observations for agriculture we highlighted satellites and sensors and their bio-geophysical applications for agriculture, as well as how to access these data products. We discussed the caveats and limitations of remote sensing and introduced the NASA Harvest Program. In today's webinar, we are focusing on soil moisture and NASA satellite observations and modeled products that provide critical information for drought monitoring agricultural monitoring, and crop forecasting. Each webinar in this series will have a one-hour presentation followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. The homework assignment for part one is already available on our webpage, and the final homework assignment will be available following part three. Answers must be submitted via Google Form with due dates of April 28th for the homework one and May 12th for homework two. If you are interested in a certificate of completion for this webinar series, you must attend all the webinars and complete all homework assignments. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marines Martin. The first half of today's webinar will focus on NASA's Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission, or SMAP. This will be led by Dr. Erica Potist, one of, RSET, one of the RSET leads for water resources and disasters. The second half of the webinar will focus on NASA's Land Data Assimilation System, or LDAS. This will be led by Dr. Amita Mekta, another RSET lead for water resources and disasters. They will provide an overview, highlight examples for agricultural applications, and how to access the data products for soil moisture analysis. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Potist. Good morning. I'm Dr. Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Today, I'll cover the first half of the webinar on soil moisture for agricultural applications, and I'll specifically talk about the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite Mission, also known as SMAP. So the outline of the presentation, I'll start out by talking about SMAP, giving you an overview. I'll talk about some examples of the use of SMAP for agricultural applications. I'll describe the SMAP products and finally how to access SMAP data. So let's get started with an overview of SMAP. So why measure soil moisture from space? The limitations in measuring soil moisture is that there are few ground stations around the world. And in addition, measurements at ground stations might not be representative of the surrounding landscape because they don't capture that heterogeneity. The advantage of measuring soil moisture from space is that uh, these measurements can be done not only on a continuous basis and at global scales, but also because they're done applying the same methodology. And that's what SMAP does. SMAP provides frequent revisit global maps of soil moisture. Now, SMAP uses a microwave sensor called a radiometer, which operates in the L-band range, specifically at 1.41 gigahertz. The radiometer measures what's called brightness temperature, which is in kelvins. And from brightness temperature, soil moisture is derived as a product. The SMAP mission also had a radar sensor. However, that sensor ceased to function three months into the science phase of the mission. The reason microwave is used is because it is sensitive to soil moisture and also because it can image the surface of the earth regardless of daylight conditions or most weather conditions. Now, the sensor uses an antenna that is six meters in diameter. As you can see in this illustration, um, you can see uh, the, the antenna. And this antenna, it actually rotates at about 14.6 revolutions per minute and creates a swath on the surface of the Earth that's 
a thousand kilometers wide. The orbit is a polar sun synchronous orbit and SMAP is at an altitude of 685 kilometers with a 6 a.m. 6 p.m. equatorial crossing. So that allows for a two to three day global re revisit because of uh, the swath to swath overlap. But in terms of an exact orbit revisit, it's an eight day exact orbit revisit. SMAP was launched into space on January 31st, 2015. Uh, it took a couple of months for the satellite to be commissioned. And as of early April, 2015, SMAP went to, into its science phase. So at that point, it started to continuously collect uh, data. So here I've listed the characteristics of SMAP soil moisture measurements. The domain is global. The spatial resolution is at 9 and 36 kilometers. The temporal repeat is every three days. So every three days you have a complete map of uh, global soil moisture. The sensing depth is approximately five centimeters. The measurement is volumetric soil moisture. That means that it's a measurement of the volume of water within a given volume of soil. And the accuracy is 0.04. Um, so that means that 0.04 volumetric. So that means that there's a, um, the error is up to 4% volumetric. And the data access policy is, the data is freely available. And I'll talk about where you can access the data at the end of this presentation. As mentioned, SMAP has a three-day temporal repeat. And this is important because it captures that surface wetting and drying. And capturing the impacts of storm, interstorm sequences combined with the inertia of surface storage requires a revisit of approximately three days. And this figure shows these wetting and drying periods. The black line is continuous soil moisture over a month. The blue inverted triangles are soil moisture sampled every seven days, and the red inverted triangles is soil moisture sampled every two and a half days. And you can see that the sampling every seven days misses those wetting and drying events, while sampling every two and a half days captures those events much better. So soil moisture varies with space and time, and there are several factors that influence the amount of water in the soil. The primary driver of soil moisture is rainfall. Soil texture also influences how long water is retained in the soil. So for example, sandy soils are more porous and, uh, than silty soils, and hence sandy soils tend to hold less water than silty soils. Vegetation plays a role in soil moisture retention. We all know that a bare surface will dry quicker than soil under vegetation. And then finally, topography influences where water tends to accumulate, and you would expect flat surfaces to accumulate more water and for longer than steep surfaces. Also in the northern hemisphere, soils in south-facing slopes will tend to dry out quicker than soils in north-facing slopes. The reason SMAP has active and passive in its name is because of the type of sensors it uses. A passive instrument, a radiometer, measures the emitted radiation from a medium, from the, the surface of the Earth in this case. And it's uh, the radiation that's emitted at 1.41 gigahertz. An active instrument, like a radar, is analogous to an ultrasound, so it, it provides its own illumination source and sends a wave and measures the reflection back from the target. As mentioned, the SMAP radar is no longer working and SMAP has relied on its radiometer to produce soil moisture products. However, SMAP is using radar data from the European Space Agency Sentinel-1 satellite, which has a radar sensor. And I'll talk about this uh, a bit further along. The use of L-band in the micro range has certain advantages, as mentioned earlier. First, it's not significantly attenuated by clouds and rain, as opposed to visible and infrared images where clouds often mask the surface of the Earth. Also, second, we can see the surface of the Earth and make measurements day and night. Other advantages is that 
Microwaves are sensitive to the water in the soil due to the dielectric properties of the soil and these, change, these can change significantly between wet and dry soils. Uh, also, L-band has a long wavelength, so it has a wavelength of approximately 24 centimeters. That means the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave is 24 centimeters. And the longer the wavelength, the more it penetrates through the vegetation and into the soil. And so that's why SMAP can measure up to, um, in general, the top five centimeters of the soil. Higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths would not penetrate as deeply into the soil. And therefore, the long wavelength at L-band is optimum for SMAP in terms of instrument design. So this is a basic overview of the measurement approach. The radiometer measures emissions and the radar measures backscatter from the land surface. So emissions that reach the radiometer come from the following components, the soil only, the vegetation only, and from the vegetation bouncing off the soil and back into the receiver. Now, interactions from the radar signal can come from the soil, the vegetation, and the vegetation soil or soil vegetation. The radar is more complex because the signal is transmitted and reflected, and hence these interactions with the vegetation can be complicated, and it's much more difficult to extract just the portion that pertains to soil moisture. So in order to measure soil moisture, you have to account for vegetation, you have to account for the surface roughness because that has an influence on the microwave signal, and you have to account for temperature, as well as a couple of other things, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So the, the SMAP soil moisture algorithm has a number of what's called ancillary data sources that inform the algorithm. So in order to tease out the soil moisture information from the signal, a large amount of information is needed about all the components contributing to the signal, such as vegetation, surface temperature, we talked about roughness. Um, and so to do this, we bring in other data sets called ancillary data sets that can be used in the retrieval and they provide information on different surface components. Um, so for example, surface air meteorology uh, that, that contains information on um, air temperature, uh, precipitation, vegetation opacity, so how thick is your vegetation, what's the water content of the vegetation, surface topography, for that a digital elevation model is used, soil textures, land water boundaries, so we want to know where uh, there's water and where there's land, obviously where there's water, a mask is applied so that there are no retrievals over areas where there's just water. Also areas where there's permanent ice and snow, there are no retrievals over those areas, as well as over large urban areas. So in addition to SMAP, there are other soil moisture satellite products, and one of them is SMOS, uh, which is from the European Space Agency. It has very similar characteristics, characteristics to SMAP, it's an L-band radiometer with 40 kilometer spatial resolution, a temporal resolution of three days, and a sensing depth of approximately five centimeters. The difference between their soil moisture product and SMAP is uh, that SMAP has a, a, what's called a radio frequency interference filter implemented. And this filter mitigates for noise in the signal. And as a result, the SMAP soil moisture data tends to be um, more continuous, so you, you don't have um, as much noise, especially in some parts of the world, um, in the data, in the product. There's also ASCAT, which is a European Space Agency scatterometer. It operates at a different frequency, but it still operates in the microwave range, so it operates at C-band, and there are products at 12 and a half and 25 kilometers, and it's uh, daily observations. So now I'll talk about some examples of agricultural applications where SMAP soil moisture data is being used. The United States Department of Agriculture uses SMAP to monitor global croplands and make commodity forecasts. And this is work developed with scientists at NASA Goddard. And they've used, uh, or they've incorporated SMAP soil moisture data into Crop Explorer, uh, which is a website 
hosted by the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service, and it reports on regional droughts, floods, and crop forecasts. Crop Explorer is a clearinghouse for global agricultural growing conditions such as soil moisture, temperature, precipitation, vegetation health, and more. The images here show that the average subsurface soil moisture um, anomalies uh, or show the average subsurface soil moisture anomalies over the southern portion of Africa for the 2016 and 2017 growing seasons. The negative values indicate that soil moisture conditions are below average, while the positive indicate a surplus of water. The area has been experiencing decline in uh, precipitation, reaching record low rainfall amounts, accompanied by high temperatures and evapotranspiration rates during the 2017 growing season. The South Africa 2017 drought caused about 29% decline in the region's wheat yield production relative to the previous year, according to the USDA FAS Crop Intelligence Report published on February 8th, 2018. So that's the small insert located in the lower left part of the chart. And the uh, current agency's crop growth and crop stress models are driven by soil moisture estimates that are generated using a simple hydrologic model. The model is highly susceptible to the quality of the precipitation data used to force the model. And so part of the study helps assess the utility of SMAP to improve the quality of USDA FAS soil moisture information and aid USDA FAS crop forecasting activities over poorly instrumented regions and areas that have poor precipitation data quality. So another application is SMAP for agricultural crop yield and food security applications. And the idea here is to use SMAP soil moisture to inform on uh, crop yield and, and food security. And this is work that's been done by my colleague from JPL, Dr. Narendra Das. So the figure here shows uh, yield in tons per hectare and on the uh, y-axis and a year from 2002 through 2010 on the x-axis. So these are corn yields, yields. And the red squares are actual observations of yields uh, throughout these different years. The uh, black circles are uh, conventional crop model yield predictions and then the green circles are yield forecasts with data simulation um, in a data simulation framework using SMAP uh, soil moisture as an input. And as you can see, in this case, when you use SMAP soil moisture uh, in this data simulation framework, it matches much uh, um, uh, better, or there's a much greater correlation um, when you use SMAP soil moisture to the actual yield observations than when you're just using a com conventional crop yield model. So along these same lines, this example shows the relationship between crop yield and soil moisture. So agricultural models have been developed to predict the yield of various uh, different types of crop crops at field and regional scales. And a key input into these models is soil moisture. This diagram relates the variation in regional average soil moisture to the variation in total crop yield. And um, you can then, uh, you, you can see that they're, they're nicely correlated. And you can take this, uh, do this statistical analysis to develop probability distributions of crop yield based on soil moisture. So this example shows the improvement of drought and flood early warning uh, with SMAP data. And this is work done by the Texas Water Development Board and UCLA. So this is the prediction of 2015 summer rainfall anomalies. And the colors here, the red indicates that uh, it's below normal, green indicates near normal, and uh, the blue indicates above normal. So these are millimeters per day. And what you're seeing on the far left are predictions using soil moisture as estimates from a model. 
the image in the middle are predictions using soil moisture from SMAP, and then the one on the right are the actual observed rainfall anomalies. So you can see that the predictions that used soil moisture from SMAP match the anomalies, the observed anomalies, um, much better than the predictions using soil moisture estimates um, from a model. In the next couple of charts, I'll talk about the SMAP products. So this is a list of the SMAP data products. NASA has a free data policy, and all of these data are freely available online. So NASA data comes at, a, at different levels, and let me explain what these levels are. The level one data is the instrument data, so that's the radar and the radiometer data. That's the raw data. The level two are the geophysical retrieval, so that, that includes soil moisture products, but they're on half orbit. So half orbit data refers to either the ascending or the descending data for any single day. And so, so for, for any single day, you've got uh, ascending, you have about 16 ascending strips as well as descending strips. The northernmost and the southernmost orbit locations demarcate the half orbit boundaries. The level three are global composites of the level two uh, products for an entire day. So the daily composites are the ascending or descending paths for a single day gridded onto a global projection. And finally, the level four products are the derived are, are modeled derived products. And in this case, they're model uh, derived products of root zone soil moisture. So that is soil moisture at uh, the one meter depth at the root zone level. So a model is used that, um, that determines or estimates what the soil moisture is one meter down. And there's also another uh, level four product, which is carbon net ecosystem exchange. Okay, so one thing to note is that when the SMAP radar ceased to function, the SMAP mission um, decided to generate what's called these enhanced products. So these were products that were not originally planned by the mission, but in lieu of the circumstances that they were generated. So I've highlighted here with a red arrow, or I'm pointing with the red arrow, the soil moisture products that might be of interest to you when, um, uh, when, when you're looking at what to download. Okay, so one of them is a SMAP radiometer and radar soil moisture product. The radar data that's being used here is from the European Space Agency Sentinel-1 radar satellite. That's a, a the characteristics of this radar sensor are slightly are different from the SMAP radar sensor. And the uh, this SMAP team has used this data together with the SMAP radiometer to create a three kilometer soil moisture product. Then there's also an enhanced um, resolution or enhanced radiometer soil moisture product. So that means that the resolution of the radiometer has been enhanced. The radiometer uh, soil moisture derived product is at 36 kilometer resolution. Now the team has applied an interpolation technique based on Bacchus Gilbert to enhance the resolution of the radiometer to nine kilometer and a soil moisture product has been generated just from the radiometer at nine kilometer resolution. The other soil moisture product that might be of interest is the level four soil moisture product. So this has surface soil moisture and root zone soil moisture. And these are not really direct observations, but they're uh, estimates using a model. Um, so estimates of surface soil moisture and estimates of root zone soil moisture uh, using a land surface model. This is an example of a level three radiometer derived soil moisture product. So this is uh, gridded at 36 kilometers. And uh, so this is a daily global composite. Um, and to generate this composite, uh, the, the processing software ingests one day's worth of level two soil moisture passive granules and creates uh, individual global composites as these two dimensional rays. 
So the composite, in this case, it used the descending passes. The descending passes are the 6 a.m. passes. And uh, you ideally want to use descending passes because in the morning, uh, the temperature of the, of the soil tends to be in equilibrium with the rest of the land surface. In the afternoon, there might be differences, and so the algorithm um, it may not be, the soil moisture um, uh, uh, retrieval algorithm may not be as accurate with the PM passes, which is around 6 PM, as the ones um, in, in, in the morning. So the important thing to note about this and, and other level three products is that in the high latitudes, some of the SWATs overlap. And when they do, the data point with an acquisition time closest to 6 a.m. local solar time is selected. So this example shows the enhanced products, one of the enhanced products. So this one is the uh, resolution of the radiometer being enhanced. And so the product on the left is a soil moisture product generated from the radiometer, the original radiometer resolution, and, and it's gridded to 36 kilometers. And the image on the right, it's the same area, same day. And so the resolution of the radiometer has been enhanced, and a soil moisture product has been created with this enhanced resolution, and it's been gridded at nine kilometers. So you can see um, quite a bit uh, uh, more uh, detail, obviously, in the enhanced resolution soil moisture product. This is an example of the SMAP uh, enhanced active passive product using Sentinel-1. And this is work done by my colleague at JPL, Dr. Narendra Das. And so the image on the left is the SMAP only the passive product, so the, the radiometer derived soil moisture uh, gridded at 36 kilometer resolution. And the image on the right is the same area uh, using the SMAP radiometer data as well as Sentinel-1. So it's a passive active product. And this is soil moisture uh, retrieved and gridded at, 30, at three kilometer resolution. And this example shows surface and root zone soil moisture. So this is a level four product. Remember, a model was used to generate this product. All level four products are uh, products that have been generated using uh, a model. So uh, what you're seeing here is root zone soil moisture. It's global root zone soil moisture from April 26, 2015. So this chart shows the areas where soil moisture is being retrieved. The areas in black are, uh, it's the retrievable mask. And it follows the following specification. So urban fraction is less than um, one. So um, areas, uh, soil moisture is retrieved in areas, in small urban areas, but in large urban areas where an urban area covers your entire pixel, those areas there is no soil moisture retrieval. The algorithm just does not work in urban environments. It works in natural systems. Areas where water fraction, so if your pixel is uh, less than half water, there's still a retrieval. There are quality flags to all of the retrievals indicating how confident um, the, the, the team is in, in that retrieval. And areas where there's a, a, a DM, so a digital elevation model slope the standard deviation is less than five degrees. So even though soil moisture is being retrieved pretty much everywhere, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the soil moisture retrieval meets the emissions accuracy requirements. So that's, that's that 4% volumetric that I talked about in the very beginning. And this map shows the areas where soil moisture is expected to meet that accuracy requirement. So the areas in black are those areas. And these are areas where vegetation water content is uh, less than five kilograms per meter square. So that means areas where the vegetation is not very dense. You can see that the Amazon and the Congo Basin, the, um, the accuracy there is not to uh, mission accuracy requirements because vegetation there is quite dense and you have uh, a large signal from the vegetation. So it's harder to really get to the moisture in the soil. 
Um, areas where the urban fraction is less than quarter of your pixel, areas where water fraction is less than 0.1 of uh, your pixel, and the DM standard deviation is less than three degrees. So over these areas um, is where the, the mission feels confident that uh, soil moisture meets the mission's um, accuracy requirements. So uh, keep in mind that even though you might have a soil moisture value for the Amazon, for a pixel in the Amazon, it doesn't mean that that soil moisture value uh, is necessarily accurate. So uh, there are quality flags associated with each retrieval, and you can check for that accuracy. So this is a really cool animation of SMAP soil moisture. Uh, uh, composited every seven days from March, uh, end of March of 2015 uh, through this, uh, 2016. So it's about a one year um, video animation. And in land, the yellow means that the soil moisture is low, while the cyan and blue areas means that soil moisture is high or higher. And uh, it's interesting, so you, you can see some interesting things here. In around June, July, you can see the onset of the monsoon, monsoon season in India. It just suddenly starts and everything gets blue. Uh, you can see some flooding in uh, Argentina um, around the summertime. Uh, you can also see some floods that occurred around 2015 in the Gulf states of the United States. Uh, also to note is that the white areas are areas where there is no soil moisture retrieval. That's because these areas are, have snow. And so during the frozen part of the year, uh, when these areas, the northern high latitudes are covered by snow, there are no retrievals in these areas. Also, there are no retrievals like in areas over Greenland, um, areas that are permanently covered by either snow or ice. Another interesting thing to note is that the ocean, there's color there. Obviously, that's not soil moisture, that's sea surface salinity. So this is a product that has been derived from the data, from the, the SMAP data. It, it wasn't a, it's not one of the, um, the nominal products from the SMAP mission, and it's been derived afterwards, after the fact. And that's a nice thing about having access to the raw data is that you can um, derive other things of interest. So in this case, sea surface salinity has been derived and areas that are um, dark blue indicate that uh, salinity is lower, while areas that are yellow and red, the uh, salinity is higher. Uh, and you can see some interesting things up in the northern high latitudes during the, uh, the melt. Uh, in, in the spring, you have a, a lot of uh, fresh water in these areas along the coast. Also, you can see the fresh water plume from the Amazon. So it's really uh, quite interesting, this animation. So now let's talk about how to access the data. So before I jump into the, the websites where you can download uh, SMAP data, let me just explain to you a little bit about the data product design. So all products are in HDF5 formats, and they contain the uh, not, not only the, the data parameters, soil moisture, but also all of the data that's used in the production of these primary parameters. So these are files that include metadata, geolocation information, quality flags, etc. The data are in East Grid uh, projection. That's an equal area projection. And uh, finally, the, the values, as mentioned before, uh, for soil moisture, they're volumetric. Um, there, it's a volumetric measurement expressed as centimeter cube over centimeter cube. Uh, most of the products are um, available from about April uh, or July 2015 through present. The level two products, uh, most of the level two products have a 24 hour latency. So that's 24 hours um, between when the observation was made and uh, you being able to access it and download the product from the Data Archive Center. The label, level three products have a latency of uh, about 50 hours um, from acquisition. The SMAP soil moisture products are archived at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And if you follow this website, uh, you'll go directly to 
the page where the data is hosted. So let's just jump over to the web page and I'll show you how to download the data. So here we are at the NSIDC SMAP page. And this is the, the main page that contains a description of SMAP and the instrument, the mission, etc. But some things to note here is on the left-hand side, there is a menu. And this menu has some, um, some tools, some interesting tools as well. So if you go to tools, you can uh, download tools to open HDF5 files. So if the current software that you're using does not open HDF5 files, uh, again, you can use any of these tools. And these are all open source tools or even code. Uh, you can use it to open your file and then export that file into a format that your software can recognize. Okay, so let's go to SMAP data. And this will take us to a page that has a list of the different SMAP data sets. Now, remember, we talked about the different level data sets, level one, two, three, four. So you have them right here. If you click on level one, there's a whole list of data sets, uh, the, the level one data sets that you can download. And there's a description uh, uh, to each data set. Um, so there's the spatial resolution, the temporal coverage, and the parameters. So we're interested really in um, the level two, level three, level four. So the level two data, you might be interested in the uh, radar, radiometer, soil moisture product. So we talked about that. Uh, so it's using the SMAP radiometer and Sentinel-1 radar data. Okay, so that would be that would be this data set here, SMAP slash Sentinel-1. Okay, that's at three kilometer resolution. And that data set spans from 2015, so end of March 2015 through present. Now, in terms of level three, you will probably be interested, most interested in the nine kilometer soil moisture product. So we talked about uh, different soil moisture products. Uh, there's the radiometer only derived soil moisture product that's at 36, it's gridded at 36 kilometers. And then there's the enhanced radiometer resolution uh, soil moisture product, and that is gridded at nine kilometers. Okay. And that data set goes, starts from, again, same time frame, end of March 2015 through present. So let's click here. And this will take you to a page where I've already defined my area of interest. But basically, what you can do in this page, let's uh, restart, let's clear this up. And I'll just show you what you can do in this page is yet you can filter the data sets. So you can set the time frame of interest. And in this case, I've set the time frame from the 1st of February of 2020 through the 5th of February 2020. So what you can do here is draw your area of interest and let's just draw a small. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Just draw a small area there. And then the results will come back depending on the parameters that you set in your filter here. So the results are based on the filters that you set. And you do need to have an account in order to download the data. You can, the account is free, but you do need to. Um, set up this account. And uh, usually it's, you can set it up immediately and uh, you get access to, uh, or you, you, you get, um, uh, you can go into your account and download the data. So basically what you do is then you have, here you can order files or it's a large custom order 
So you order files and you'll get an email providing you with a link where you can then download those images. Okay. Another way to download data is through the NASA Earth Data search engine. And so if you go to this link here, you'll go to this web page, and here you can do a search for SMAP. And you can also do set your filters so you can define a start and end date. So let's start the 1st of February, 2020, and let's just end, say the 7th, okay? And then you can define an area of interest. So let's just draw a rectangle over a small area of interest, in this case in Mali. Okay, so uh, when you do a search for SMAP data, there are different products, SMAP derived products, and the one we want to select is this one, the SMAP Enhanced Level 3 Radiometer Global Daily 9 Kilometer Ease Grid Soil Moisture. So you, you select that. And there are seven, seven granules, seven images within your search area or that cover your search area. And then what you do is uh, you can, let's say we want to download all. Again, you also need to establish an account. Uh, opening an account is free. So you download all. And the nice thing about this one is that you have an option to customize your download. So you need to input your email address and you can specify what sort of output format you want. So if you don't wanna deal with HDF5, uh, maybe uh, you prefer NetCDF uh, or GeoTIFF or an ASCII file. So let's just go with GeoTIFF. It asks you if you want to subset. So remember these are, actually these are uh, global mosaics. So you can enter a bounding box here for just your area of interest. Reprojection, do you wanna reproject this? Remember it's in an uh, ease grid and you can reproject it to these different pro projections. And then here, what you wanna do is you wanna select which files uh, you want. So you want, so let's just open this. So within an HDF file, you'll have all of the files that were used to generate that particular soil moisture product. And if you're not interested in, in using or in all of that information, you can, in this case, just select the files that are most interest of most interest to you. So you definitely want the soil moisture file. You might want the soil moisture error. Um, you might want the latitude and longitude. So you'll have to go through through all of these uh, file names and select which one you're most interested in, okay? In, in addition to the soil moisture. Uh, one thing to note is that there's the soil moisture retrieval data AM, that's the descending pass, and then there's the soil moisture retrieval PM, that's the ascending pass. Uh, you'll want to preferably use the AM. Uh, that's because the soil moisture retrievals at, with the AM pass tend to be um, a bit more accurate than the ones in the PM pass. Okay, so you're done and then you download the data and what the system will do is they'll send you an email and they'll give you a link where you can download the data. Okay, so a final um, a platform that I wanted to make you aware of is called Appears. And this is actually uh, my favorite platform. 
because uh, you have um, many different options here for downloading the data. So you can, if you go to that link, you'll go to this main web page and you can specify either point samples or area samples. So let's go with area samples and we'll start a new request and we'll just name this uh, test SMAP. Okay, so then it says, you can drop a vector file here containing the, your area of interest. So you have several options. You can um, either draw a, a polygon on the map, delineating your area of interest or just the point of interest or just drop a vector file, a shape file here um, that will delineate your area of interest. And the file that's returned to you will be the values for um, the area that you've delineated, okay? Again, you do here, uh, you, you specify here, there's a start date and the end date. And where it says select the layers to include, you'll say SMAP and you'll have a list of the different SMAP products and the one that uh, would be or, or probably the one you'd be most interested in is the SMAP enhanced resolution radiometer derived soil moisture product. So that's the nine kilometer daily, global daily product. There's also the uh, surface and root zone soil moisture that we had talked about. So if you're interested, probably not so much in the surface because this is a model parameter, but the root zone soil moisture. So this, these are both level four products. Um, then you can click here to select uh, that product. So let's just select this and then you'll have a list of all of the files that are included for each soil moisture um, file, right? So you want to select which one you're interested in. There's the retrieval quality flag, same as, as um, the Earth Data Search Engine. Uh, so let's just stick to soil moisture. Oh, you do use. Okay. And then you have two uh, options here, GeoTIFF or NetCDF, and then you can search for a projection. Here you have a number of different projections that were not available in the previous example that I showed you from the Earth Data Search Engine. So again, this is all a matter of, of uh, preference, and then you click Submit. Okay, so I didn't specify my area, but yeah, you go through the steps. You also need to have a, an account in order to uh, download the data. Again, opening an account is free. Now, let me just show you very quickly how these data look. So I'm using Panoply and I opened an HDF5 file. And when you open the HDF5 file, uh, as I mentioned, each HDF5 file has all of the data sets, everything that was used to generate that soil moisture product. So you really have to search through the different folders. There's a lot of information in here. And what you wanna do is uh, you wanna open, open the, the, I have two, two different files here open. So you wanna open the soil moisture retrieval data. Again, preferably you wanna work with the AM uh, rather than the PM, slight differences between both of those, slightly more accurate in the AM, and then go through and look at all the different um, files that are associated with that AM retrieval. Obviously, the one that you're most interested in is the actual soil moisture file. So you click on this and create. And here we have a soil moisture file. And you can, in Panoply, you can play around with the, the scaling, uh, the color bar, yeah, you can do overlays and you can do a bunch of stuff. Okay, but the idea is if you wanna export this, uh, you can also export from Panoply into different formats. But, so whenever you download an HDF file, five file, it's remember, and, and it's a level three, it's a global image. So you will have to open the file and then 
extract your area or your point of interest. And that's why these other tools are uh, quite useful, the Earth Data Search Engine or appears because you can actually extract the data for your specific area of interest rather than having to download an entire global file and then going in and extracting um, the values for just your area of interest. So that concludes this, uh, th this part of the webinar. Uh, I'll be uh, taking your questions at the end. And now my colleague, Dr. Amita Mehta, will cover the second part of this webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean and Erica, uh, for the information about uh, soil moisture from SMAP. Uh, now, this section will focus on soil moisture for agricultural application from land data assimilation system. We already saw the remote sensing data about soil moisture from SMAP. High quality data are available since 2015. However, Land data assimilation system, which is a modeling system, provides longer term estimation of soil motion. And so this is also a source of soil motion that we are going to look at. So what we're going to do is start with overview of land data assimilation system, then see a couple of examples of how LDAS is used for agricultural applications. Then we will have how to uh, access LDAS data uh, and then we'll have a brief demonstration of how soil moisture from LDAS can give indication of agricultural uh, productivity. So with that, we'll start with overview of uh, land data assimilation system. First of all, why do we need LDAS? Uh, so basically that is for water and land management. And as you can see, there is a little schematic video here on the right hand side. But basically for proper characterization of spatial and temporal variations in water and energy states, that means soil moisture and temperature and fluxes. So energy fluxes like evaporation and runoff, uh, they are critical for many applications. Weather prediction is one, agricultural forecasting, drought and flood risk assessment, improving understanding of land and atmosphere interactions, and then also climate change impacts. To understand all these, it's, it's important or it's critical to know how uh, water and land, uh, they interact with atmosphere and how water is cycled through different components of uh, land and atmosphere. So that's why um, not only just for scientific understanding, but also for application LDAS is needed. Another reason is if you look at surface-based observations as an example shown here on the right-hand side, um, these are soil moisture observations. As you can see, there are various ground and space-based uh, land and hydrology observations, such as in this case, soil moisture. There are also precipitation, evapotranspiration, land surface temperature data are available, but they have spatial and temporal gaps, as you can see. Uh, uh, most of the world is not covered by in situ data um, when it comes to soil moisture. Sometimes, if even if the data are available, they're not they're uh, not really distributed to everyone to understand better. And so, LDAS integrates surface-based whatever is available and remote sensing-based observations and provides uniformly graded more frequent information than satellite can provide or in situ data can provide of water and energy components. And LDAS provides quantities that are not directly observed by satellites also. So in addition to soil moisture, which now is being measured by satellite, there is runoff and evapotranspiration, snow water equivalents. These are not directly observed by remote sensing and they can be calculated by LDAS. So to get complete water budget and land atmosphere interaction uh, through this cycling of water can be understood by running LDAS. 
So land surface model structure is shown here in general. And want to point out uh, Dr. Matt Roto from NASA. He is in charge of LTAS. And if any detailed questions, you can uh, you can contact him for more questions. But so land surface models, they usually solve for interaction of energy, momentum, and mass between surface and the atmosphere. And in each model grid as shown here, usually the time step used is as short as 15 minutes. And not only like th these are general grid, but subgrid level details are provided to have better interaction of surface vegetation and atmosphere transfer of energy and water. So precipitation and solar energy, they both are received by vegetation and surface and how the water is cycled through different layers, how then it is given back to atmosphere through land and vegetation uh, through evapotranspiration that is calculated by ALDAS. Also energy is used to uh, for evaporation, evapotranspiration, and also to cycle water through the system. So these components are actually individually derived or calculated by LDAS. And for that, system of equations are used. So surface energy conservation equation, surface water conservation equation, soil water flow, and evaporation, uh, which the well-known feynman monteith equation. So these are um, the basis of LDAS. In, for, for LSM to run properly, there is forcing required. And so some input parameters first, these are static parameters, um, semi-static parameters, but they provide subgrid scale information such as vegetation greenness or leaf area index, uh, vegetation classes, soil type, elevation, these have to be provided for proper characterization of water and energy transfer. And required forcing are basically weather parameters such as near surface wind speed uh, and precipitation, surface pressure, humidity and temperature, and energy, which is downward short wave or solar radiation and long wave radiation, which comes from the atmosphere itself. So all these are required inputs. And after going through the system of equations, then these are the outputs which are available from LDAS. Soil moisture, it's in multiple layers, as you can see, from top layer, top 10 centimeters, all the way to from 40 to 100 centimeters, and integrated zero to uh, surface to 100 centimeters, also available. In addition, there are uh, sensible and latent and ground heat fluxes, radiation, uh, surface and subsurface runoff, soil temperature in each layer, snow water equivalent, snowfall and rainfall, uh, evaporation, transpiration, and snow melt. These are available as outputs. We are going to focus on soil moisture for this particular uh, session. There are a number of global and regional LDAS systems. Global Land Data Assimilation System, GLDAS, they are all linked here. You can uh, get more information by clicking on them. North American Land Data Assimilation System, FAMIN Early Warning System Network or FUSENET Land Data Assimilation System, that's FLDAS, and the National Climate Assessment Land Data Assimilation System. As you can see, NLDAS and NCALDAS, they are regional. GLDAS and FLDAS are global. We're going to focus for data access and demonstration. We'll look at GLDAS and NLDAS. But we, you can find information on the same uh, pages about these two also. So for GLDAS and NLDAS, a summary is given here. And papers describing these systems are provided here, uh, references. One thing to notice is, that um, there are multiple land surface models used in each of these systems. Uh, these are all different uh, land atmosphere interaction uh, models. So variable infiltration capacity, um, 
Sacramento Snow Model, Community Land Model, these are used by GLDAS and NLDAS. In addition, GLDAS has multiple versions. GLDAS 2 and 2.1, we are going to focus on 2.1, which is the late, latest version. And uh, as you can see, this is one model that's used for 2.1, that's NOVA 3.3. Uh, each of these have temporal information given here, uh, hourly and three hourly. So hourly for NLDAS, three hourly for GLDAS, that information is available. In addition, daily and monthly data are also available. As you can see, NLDAS is available from 1979 onwards, GLDAS 2.1, which is completely forced by observations, is uh, available from 2000 onwards. And resolution for NLDAS is one eighth of a degree. For GLDAS 2.1 is quarter of a degree and one degree. These are the resolutions available. We'll focus on NLDAS and GLDAS version 2.1 when we look at data access. So what is the difference between GLDAS 2.1 and NLDAS um, or GLDAS 2.0 or other versions? It's basically where the inputs are coming from. For GLDAS 2.1, precipitation forcing is provided from Global Precipitation Climatology Project. This is based on multiple satellite and gauge data combined. Also, weather information comes from meteorological data from uh, NSEP, which is a National Center for Environmental Prediction for their global data assimilation system. So atmospheric data also use remote sensing observations in assimilation and provide meteorological data, which are then given to GLDAS. And then surface radiation is received from Air Force Weather, Weather Agency. In NLDAS, precipitation is provided from Climate Prediction Center gauge data, also stage two Doppler radar. Uh, there is CMORPH, uh, which also is um, precipitation information, CPC morphing technique, and uh, North American Regional Reanalysis provides meteorological and radiation data. So these are various inputs. But they all provide outputs, which are integrated outputs, as we just saw here. These are the in outputs available from each of the systems, no matter what the inputs are. Also, one more point to make is there is land information system. Um, more information can be found here, and schematic is shown here. This is the uh, software framework for LDAS. And what LIS allows is assimilation of different data sets uh, into these land surface models, uh, can allow different forcing for inputs, and it can be customized regionally. So LIS allows customized land data assimilation system. Uh, you can build, uh, assemble, and reconfigure easily for any uh, small region. So this is the software framework for LDAS. With that, we're going to see a couple of examples of how LDAS is used for agricultural application. FLDAS, or Femin Early Warning, um, is shown here. Um, it produces 10 kilometer resolution soil moisture estimates from 1982 to present, and it's updated twice a month. FuseNet was set up by USAID um, as leading provider of early warning and evidence-based analysis on food insecurity. And soil moisture is used for that in addition to other parameters from LDAS. It uses customized lists to leverage existing land surface models and generate ensemble of soil moisture, ET, and other variables based on multiple meteorological inputs or land surface models. So to reduce uncertainties, multiple inputs are used, multiple land surface models are used, and ensemble is then used to come up with uh, parameters which can indicate um, if there is famine um, onset going on or if there is uh, uh, food insecurity resulting um, because of that. And one example is shown here is the uh, global soil moisture content um, shown here 
it shows these red areas where there is uh, much less uh, soil moisture and that indicates where there would be less agricultural productivity. Another application is here is of NLDAS. Example shows um, it's used for drought monitoring. And again, um, this is an example of uh, soil moisture. This was uh, in March 25th this year. As you can see, deficit of soil moisture in certain areas where one would expect uh, drought uh, or agricultural drought. And so NLDAS, this is an experimental drought monitoring. It's derived from near real-time soil moisture output from both the NASA MOSIC and NSEP NOAA land surface models in NLDAS. And the soil moisture anomalies and percentiles are derived from long-term climatological data from 80 to 2007. And more information can be found here. But basically, soil moisture anomalies and percentile values are used to predict um, or diagnose how drought, where it is occurring. One more regional project example is given here and uh, references provided here for details. It's LDAS for Morocco. And this is, again, uh, focusing just on the country of Morocco. It's the regional project financed by Global Environmental Facility, um, and it's managed by World Bank, USAID, and NASA. And that uses LDAS to come up with a composite drought indicator, or CDI, uh, which uses LDAS output as part of it. And so as shown here, these are the uh, maps of uh, drought indices and 2015-16 uh, as drought was developing, it was monitored by using LDAS on Morocco. So these are some of the examples which give you a deficit of um, soil moisture, um, how temperature is changing at land surface, and that provides you information about how agricultural productivity be, be affected by um, it, by these parameters. So what we're going to see next is how to access LDAS data. So we'll focus again on GLDAS 2.1 and LDAS, NLDAS, how to get these data from these web tools. So first is Giovanni. And those of you who have taken RSAT webinars before are familiar with Giovanni, perhaps. Um, it allows you to uh, pick a region, uh, pick different analysis and different times so special temporal subsetting is available uh, and you can have different analysis such as map time series analysis uh, you can have vertical cross section and histogram also are available so we'll look at this how to get data how to get um, not only extract data analyze it have visualization done online uh, without downloading data, and you can also download data using this. Then for bulk access of GLDAS and NLDAS data, we are going to look at this site, Goddard Earth Sciences Data Information Services Center, or GES disk. This also allows spatial and temporal subsetting. Also, one can parameter uh, sub subset parameters also, choose particular parameters such as soil moisture or ET. And one can uh, then download data um, by using script uh, or wget and curl, as we will see, to have bulk download in NetCDF format so that you can do further analysis with it. So next, we will have demonstration of data access. We'll focus on GLDAS 2.1. And we will also have an example of analysis of soil moisture as indicator of um, how it, it impacts agricultural production. Thank you. So this is a demonstration of how to access and download LDAS soil moisture data uh, using Giovanni and GS disk, the tools that we just reviewed. So now both these tools allow data search by a keyword. They both allow spatial and temporal subsetting of data and also downloading data in various formats. But GES disk is more useful for bulk download of digital data, whereas Giovanni also allows online analysis and visualization before downloading the data. So we will see these features in this demonstration. 
So for demonstration, for this demonstration, we will focus on soil moisture data from GLDAS version 2.1 as an example. However, both GS Disk and Giovanni provide access to NLDAS and FLDAS data also. Now, while GLDAS provides global soil moisture data, for the demonstration, we'll focus on a specific region. And for this demonstration, we've picked the country of Thailand in Mekong River Basin. It's, this is a report by UN Food and Agricultural Organization or FAO. And in their annual crop production report, what it shown is that Thailand had crop production deficit in 2019 compared to last previous five years and also compared to 2018. Now, there are several countries in the world where there was larger deficit, but we picked Thailand because overall in Mekong Basin, there was a drought-like condition. So what we will do is first look at GES disk and see how to download data for this region. And then we will see a case study of soil moisture analysis over Thailand using Giovanni. We will also see how soil moisture data downloaded from Giovanni can be readily used in software packages like Excel or QGIS to conduct further analysis. So with that, we will start with GES disk. This is the website. Here is the keyword search for the data that you want to download or looking for. So one point to note here is that you will require a login to NASA Earth Data. Um, you, if you are not a user, when you, you will see a login button here. And when you click on that, it will guide you to register as a user. If you already are a user, you can use your username and password. This will also work with Giovanni. So all NASA websites usually require login with NASA Earth data and then the data are completely open and free. So with GES disk, we already know that we want to look at soil moisture from GLDAS version 2.1. And we are also going to look at NOAA LSM as we reviewed in, in the presentation. So we can search with the string. It's, it looks through the catalog and comes up with the list of data available with GLDAS NOAA 2.1. So you can see that there are monthly data and there are three hourly data at one degree resolution and quarter degree resolution. Also, the extent, temporal extent here is January 2000 to December 2019. You will also see in certain version, there is more current data available. These are early products, but we're going to focus on these products, which actually use GPCP as forcing. So we are going to look at monthly quarter degree GLDAS data. So once you pick that data, you can click here. It provides product summary here, data citation, papers, and documentation is given here as well about this data set. To download, to access data for a specific region and download it, this subset and get data option is what we're going to use. Once you click on there, you can say refine date range. You can pick one year or many year. For example, we can pick 2019 January to December 2019. Uh, for temporal range, then refine region. If you're looking for global data, you don't have to do anything. But if you are looking for a particular region, you can use to draw a rectangle or a circle or draw a marker. You can zoom in, you can pan the map. 
In this case, we're going to focus on the Mekong Basin, the country of Thailand, if you like. This allows to draw a rectangle and whatever data you pick will be for this temporal range and this special domain. Here is also selection for variables. As we saw in the presentation, GLDAS has multiple outputs and you can look through it if you are interested in more parameters, but we are going to focus on soil moisture, 0 to 10 centimeters. You can pick that, this is surface soil moisture. You can pick other soil moisture levels, layers as well. And here, here are the units, kilograms per meter square. Once you pick that, you can go down to file format. And there are multiple formats available, either GeoTIFF or NetCDF is default. You can pick either one and then you can say get data. Once you ask for data, it comes up with the list of files. These are files for 12 months of 2019. You can have them all the years and so you will have you will have all the files listed here. You can click on individual file to download on your computer or you can go through this procedure shown here. You can download the link of all, all these files in a file and then you can use wget and curl or curl to download data. So if you have many many months of data you don't want to click individually and then you can use this wget or curl. Um, there is instruction for how to download wget or curl if you don't have them on your computer. Also for your own operating system like Windows or Mac or Linux. But once you download then he here is the command to use. So wget and here is the file name url.txt where you, you have saved all links to all the files that appeared on the previous page. And then it will go ahead and download each and every file automatically on your computer. So this is a, a quick way to download a large number of files. And that's, that's why GSDisk is useful for bulk download. So next we will see how to analyze soil moisture data using Giovanni before we download the data. Here's the Giovanni website and here also you will need to log in. Here's the keyword search window. We can be more specific here and say soil moisture GLDAS 2.1 and search it comes up with the list of all the options this is similar to what we saw in GSTIS but specifically for soil moisture uh, has three hourly as well as monthly data at two different resolution between 2000 and 2019 we're going to pick monthly quarter degree soil moisture between 0 and 10 centimeters in kilograms per meter square and then pick additional options. On top you will see analysis options. You can make maps of soil moisture. You can compare different data sets, take vertical cross section. In this case you will have to go down from surface to 2200 centimeters. Um, so it's different layers you can see, time series and some other analysis options. We're going to maps of soil moisture over Thailand and also time series of soil moisture over Thailand focusing on 2019 eventually where we saw that there was crop deficit. So let's pick time series first and go to seasonal option. Next we can pick spatial domain. You can also draw a rectangle like in GES disk but in this case we have shape file selector so different countries or river basin or US states can be selected by that shape file and in this case 
we're going to pick Thailand and this area gets highlighted next we will look at temporal selection first we will look at annual cycle of soil moisture so for all months and for all years that data are available let's see how soil moisture changes so start year is 2000 and end year is 2019 once you plot once you select all these options and say plot data the workflow launches and you will get the uh, result in in terms of time series and I've already done this so let's look at the time series here's the time series plot what you see is from 2000 to 2019 each month how soil moisture varied that is shown here this is the soil moisture content you can point the arrow on each of these curves and it tells you which month it, it is you can also click down here to pick a particular month so this gets and it shows how soil moisture varied now this is a busy plot but with all the months you can see that in general soil moisture for most months did decrease in 2019 compared to 2018 what we will do is we will further analyze this data using excel to see this clearly and for that we can download these time series data you can download each monthly file as netcdf or you can download this csv file which you can further analyze in excel i have already saved this file on my computer that we will look at later before we do that let's also do map analysis so we can go back to data selection and now we can do map here also let's look at monthly and seasonal averages first here we can instead of months let's pick seasons so we can quickly see seasonal maps of soil moisture or thailand and let's first pick 2000 to 2019 so we get a long-term mean of soil moisture over these seasons once you select all these options and plot data you will get four maps which i already have here so these are long-term mean soil moisture map 0 to 10 centimeter um, on on right hand side you will see the scale for soil moisture and for four maps so winter spring summer and fall all four seasons are shown here long-term mean soil moisture and it shows special variations over the country as well as temporal seasonal evolution of soil moisture these data can also be further analyzed using QGIS or any other software after you download them so once you pick this downloads options you have these files as netcdf or as png images as tiff images or as kmz files which you can view with google earth tiff files can be analyzed uh, with qgis or any other gis um, netcdf files can be analyzed with other software or gis also so you can download whichever format is preferable in this case for example i have downloaded june july and august of um, this long-term mean soil moisture in tiff format and i've already saved on the computer also i've done one more analysis step i have picked all four seasons but just for one year now 2019 and now when you plot the data you get map seasonal maps just for one year so we have long-term mean as well as now we have a single year mean so this is for winter of 2019 spring summer and 
fall seasons of 2019 and what we want to see is you can compare these maps with this long term maps you can visually look at this you can also change uh, color options here and set minimum and maximum values same for all the maps to compare them uh, so this is possible so you can visually compare long term mean with uh, 2019 data and see whether you see excess or deficit of soil moisture also um, which might uh, indicate a reduction in, in crop production. But what we are going to do that, we're going to quickly see that in QGIS. Um, so I have also downloaded this data as TIFF and we'll just see now an example of how to further analyze this data in Excel and QGIS. So we'll start with Excel file. I saved CSV file of time series um, and what you see here is all these years 2000 to 2019 and all 12 months. Furthermore, I did average for each of these months. So January mean, February mean and so forth by using this average function here. And then I have made a plot of this long term mean annual cycle, which is shown here. What you see is soil moisture um, is uh, between May and October, there is maximum soil moisture. And especially in, in, in June, July, August, you have a lot of soil moisture. And that makes sense as this is the rainy season and then soil moisture increases during that period. Next, what we've done is taken this 2019 soil moisture for each month and subtracted this mean data, mean soil moisture data from that. And so that the, this row here shows anomalies or departure from mean for 2019. And that is plotted here. So what you see here is that except for January and February, in 2019, all months had negative anomalies. That means deficit of soil moisture compared to long-term mean. So again, for crop production, soil moisture is not the only indicator. Uh, you will also look at precipitation, evapotranspiration, land surface temperature, etc. But in this case, clearly, uh, surface soil moisture or soil moisture between 0 and 10 centimeters from GL dust does show an indication that or it indicates that soil moisture anomaly indeed was negative uh, reflecting deficit of soil moisture and corresponds to in this case uh, deficit of crop production. So this was more of like temporal analysis. You can also look at special part of it and that I've done in QGIS and this is a quick demonstration of that. So long term mean and 2000 uh, January, um, June, July, August, these summer seasons are loaded here and then difference of 2019 minus this long term mean is shown as anomalies here. And that was done just by using raster calculator and doing subtraction of these two uh, layers. And this map shows anomalies or deviation departure of soil moisture from long term mean. And so corresponding to the time series, this shows the special part where in which area there was soil moisture deficit in 2019 summer this is summer and you can see that all these regions yellow to red they all have soil moisture deficit in 2019 so just the conclusion of this demonstration is that gs disk should be used for bulk download it allows allows for files art or files can be downloaded in Giovanni, you don't have to download data to do calculations. You can do online calculations. You can do visualization and compare 
on Giovanni or you can download those files and easily analyze in additional software such as GIS or uh, Excel as we saw here. So this concludes the demonstration and um, I'll hand it back to Sean for a question and answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, everyone. Uh, now we will address the questions that you have. Uh, there is a question answer. You can type all your questions in the chat box and then you will see this question answer document. We will also post this online. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Eka Podest here uh, as well as Sean and I myself will be uh, answering some of the questions. So Erica, I um, invite you to take the first few questions which are related to SMAP. Uh, yes, of course. So let's start with question number one. Could it be possible or reliable to retrieve soil moisture from SAR data with a high spatial resolution? Even though the SMAP soil moisture products are derived from the combination of passive and active microwave data, we rarely seen the active only soil moisture products, right? What's the future of the soil moisture retrieval study from SAR observations? These are really great questions, okay. So I'll start with the first one. It is possible to retrieve soil moisture from SAR data only. And there are several algorithms out there in the published literature. However, it's not straightforward. Getting to soil moisture is with uh, SAR data is not straightforward. Um, I uh, recommend for you to uh, see some of the SAR webinars we've had in the past. We've had some advanced land cover SAR webinars where we talked about the use of SAR for agriculture and um, what the approach is and what some of the challenges are using radar. So radar is an active sensor. So it sends a signal, that signal scatters when it reaches the surface of the earth. And then part of that scattered energy is collected by the sensor. And so that signal interacts with different components of the land surface as it goes in and as it is reflected back. So basically you need to uh, be able to characterize the other components of the land surface. And your signal, you've got information about vegetation, veget you know, roughness, uh, water content in the vegetation. You've got a whole bunch of information within the SAR signal and so basically you have to tease out the land cover component to get to the part that corresponds to, to soil moisture. So this map soil moisture products are derived primarily from microwave data. Uh, initially there was the radar uh, which uh, ceased to function early on in the mission and so SMAP has been relying primarily on its radiometer, which is passive. I did talk about a SMAP product that uses Sentinel-1 data, and that's C-band data. So um, you can uh, download this data and, and, and test it. It is a, a, a beta version, so, um, but you can uh, certainly have uh, access it uh, without any cost. So I hope that answers your question about why we rarely see the active only soil moisture products, just because it is more challenging. And what is the future of soil moisture retrieval study from SAR observations? Um, so there will be a radar mission called NISAR in the next coming two years. And it's a joint mission between NASA and the Indian Space Agency, Israel, and that has an L-band SAR sensor. And I think uh, there will be, uh, um, or that data can be used to try to get to soil moisture. And it is ideal, it is an ideal frequency because L-band penetrates deeper into the soil. So um, it's better to get at soil moisture. Question two, can I perform wheat crop mapping using Sentinel-1? Uh, and, and yes, uh, you can. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean about wheat crop mapping. Are you trying to 
identify wheat crops or are you trying to identify the growth stages in wheat uh, crops? Uh, so I suggest going back to the SAR webinars that we did uh, last year. And there's a, a couple of webinars on agriculture, and those were led by Dr. Heather McNair from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and she did an excellent job in showing how you can use SAR for agriculture. What free computing tools are available for, process, for digital processing of satellite images by remote sensing applied to surveying land cover? So there are a number, and as listed here, there's a Google Earth Engine, there's SNAP, which is ESA, yeah, the European Space Agency's um, software to not only process and analyze Sentinel data, but it allows you to uh, process and analyze other uh, data as well. There's QG's Python R. Question number four, if it's sun synchronous, why do we need active sensors in SMAP? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. So it's sun synchronous, it's actually going over the equator at around 6 a.m. Uh, and 6 p.m. And so when you're using SMAP derived products, you'll see that there's a soil moisture product that is derived from the morning pass, the 6 a.m. pass, and another one that's derived from the um, evening pass. And the one that you want to use is the morning pass. And the reason for this is because the radiometer is sensitive to the temperature. And in the morning, um, it, everything is in, it, it's assumed that everything is in equilibrium. In the afternoon, you have more changes in temperature, so the vegetation is going to have a different temperature than the soil. And so the soil moisture retrieval will be a little different and, and uh, not as accurate as the morning retrieval. Question number five. I'm building a model for crop water requirements, which gives daily outputs to farmers about their crop water requirements soil moisture, ET, et cetera. Which free and commercial items do you advise which give daily satellite images with appropriate resolutions? Okay. So daily, so I'll talk about SMAP. SMAP is not daily. So SMAP has daily observations, but it really does covers the globe about every three days. If you're in the northern high latitudes, maybe every two days because there's a bit more overlap. Um, Amita, would you like to talk about the other products? Uh, yes, um, so LDAS provides uh, not only daily, you can go three hourly as well, it's a model data. So it integrates satellite and in situ data and comes up with uniformly gridded frequent data. So daily data, as we saw, can be opted from LDAS. We focused on monthly data, but you can get daily data. So both soil moisture and ET are available from LDAS. Resolution, of course, is quarter degree in this case, so it's not super high, um, but we will see it, um, at the in the last session that there are high resolution ET data available uh, from based on MODIS, Landsat, and now even WEIRS um, sensors. So we will have an overview of that in week four. These are all free data. Um, I'm not sure or I'm, I'm not familiar with any commercial data which are available. Um, so ET data from MODIS also has, if they're not, they're, they're semi-daily, one to two days. Uh, Lancet data are every 16 days. So these are not daily data, but, uh, so that way, LDAS provides you moderate resolution or quarter degree data at almost daily. So you can you you have to you can combine different um, data sets as well from satellite and model to to build your 
the model. Great. So the next question, what is the extension of the data of SMAP? I'm not sure I understand that question fully in terms of extension of the data. So there's been a, an enhanced products that are derived, and those products have been derived from the beginning of the mission. So if you go to the NSIDC, uh, to that page I showed you, it shows you the coverage of data. So SMAP was launched in early 2015, and the science phase of the mission started around early April. So there's, there's SMAP data that goes from early April 2015 through present. SMAP soil moisture data. Question seven, how will the soil moisture be applicable for the agricultural dominated Gangetic Plain of India? I think what soil moisture allows is to see the dynamic variability of soil moisture in this large area. Uh, Amita, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yes, so basically if you if you can monitor changes in soil moisture throughout the growing season, that will help you assess um, water availability for crops. So that is uh, one way of uh, looking at it because uh, of course, precipitation, land surface temperature, ET, they all matter, but both soil moisture and ET, they indicate uh, hydrological deficit of water or hydrological drought type of condition. So just monitoring soil moisture over the plain um, would tell you which part has water deficit and which part are okay. So I guess um, just throughout the growing season, monitoring soil moisture does indicate availability of water for crops. That's my conjecture. Okay, question number seven, sorry, eight. How is SMAP different from wetness index in tassel cap transformation? So I have not done a comparison between the two to tell you how it's different, but Tassel cap transformation, you're using optical spectral data. SMAP is using microwave data. So there is a fundamental difference there in that with microwave data, you are you have the ability to penetrate through certain level of vegetation and into the soil. And that's something that you cannot do with optical data. Question nine, is there any open source code available for crop type mapping? Amita? I, yes, I think, um, Sean, you may add more to this, but there is open source code available through this site here uh, to for crop type mapping. And Sean, please add if you want to add any information to this. Yeah, there's a there's a, a list of, of different open source code you can find going to this link. Uh, one caveat being a lot of the research is empirical in nature, so it will be applicable to that specific study area. So you will need to be careful when you're going through the the, the different code, which is which which can be found on that link. Uh, and it, I think that's one of the challenges is finding robust code that is applicable to wide geographies in different continents. But yeah, definitely go there and you can you can search for uh, a code. Okay, so question number 10. Over what period is the SMAP soil moisture anomaly calculated? So SMAP has a number of products that you can access that are freely available. There is no such thing as a SMAP soil moisture anomaly. You can calculate that yourself. And the period of time that SMAP has a, a soil moisture product starts, as I mentioned, from April 2015 through present. So uh, question 11 is, how is root mean square error calculated? And 
um, I'm not sure whether you're asking about any specific uh, data set here or general um, how it's calculated. So usually, I mean, it, it, there are standard routines to calculate root mean square error. It takes um, data that you want to compare with in situ data, uh, take the difference, square them, uh, add them over the period or the domain you are interested in, and then just normalize with the number of uh, data points that you have. So that's just the procedure. But basically, it just tells you, uh, it, it helps you compare your satellite data or model data um, with in situ data and see how different how different they are and what kind of errors they have. That's what they mean. I'm not sure whether you're asking in general or you have any specific parameter in mind, but it's a standard way of looking at error estimates. Okay, question number 12. Despite the spatial resolution of SMAP is approximately 9 to 40 kilometers, would it be viable to perform small-scale soil moisture analysis, 10 meters to 500 meters, by conducting calibrations using SMAP values as a reference? Yeah, I have to think about this. I mean, this is sort of a, a scaling exercise where you're looking at the variability within a SMAP pixel, within a, 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 a SMAP soil moisture uh, pixel. So, I think so it would matter a lot on soil characteristics plus uh, what kind of slopes within that pixels are. So. I guess if you have um, in situ measurements which are higher resolution over some region, you can, I don't think you can downscale without having um, soil characteristics information and slope information at that um, resolution. As, like 10 meters, you need to know what kind of soil is there, how much will percolate, how much will stay. Um, and if you know the slope, how much will run off? So that would help you decide how to distribute a SMAP pixel into uh, high resolution. This is what's done with precipitation also, but downscaling usually is a tricky issue. One has to be careful. Uh, good point. Yes, definitely. Uh, that would be the approach for this. So question 13 is about the pest problem and you know, obviously moisture matters also temperature also matter uh, i'm not aware of any uh, technique or model at this point uh, which can say anything about pest problem or can address that um, sean if you have anything otherwise we can we can come back and answer this question once we have some information So question number 14, can a radiometer resolution be brought down under five kilometers? Any insights into future missions providing improved resolution with a passive microwave sounder? So you can enhance the resolution up to a certain point. Actually, the SMAP radiometer uh, the original resolution is around 40 kilometers, and it's gridded to 36. The enhanced resolution is actually around 25 kilometers, but it's gridded to 9 kilometers. Um, insights into future missions providing improved resolution with passive microwave. I, I don't have into any insights into upcoming yeah. missions. No, I don't know about uh, high, that high resolution, but if you look at something like GMI, so GPM microwave imager, for certain frequencies, it's a passive instrument. It it has resolution of about five to ten kilometers right now. 
but I'm not aware of any sounder or future passive microwave sounder with that resolution. Question 15, was this map nine kilometer data downscaled from the 36 kilometer product? What are the potential errors associated with the interpolation? Yes, so this map nine kilometer uh, was uh, it, through an interpolation technique, the resolution was enhanced from 36 and it's gridded to nine kilometers. What are the potential errors associated with the interpolation? Uh, I can, if you send me an email, I can point you to the technique and um, some of the errors associated with interpolating. The next question, 16, which SMAP data is used by USDA for crop forecasting activities? Uh, I believe USDA is using the SMAP uh, level three soil moisture data, the nine kilometer, but I would have to double check on that. Would it, question 17, would it be possible or useful to merge this map with the AMSR2 soil moisture? Yes, absolutely. Um, especially if there are gaps, um, SMAP, uh, the data tends to be uh, fil filtered um, wherever there is radio frequency interference. Uh, AMSR2 is a different frequency, so you will be seeing soil moisture at a different depth, actually, so it's much shallower than SMAP. How does the algorithm work in urban areas? Does it use any proxy or just show pixels with no values? So for SMAP, the algorithm does not work in large urban areas. Uh, the algorithm is meant to work in natural systems and urban areas, it just gets uh, very complicated with all of the paved areas. So basically, large urban areas are masked out. Uh, question 19 is, is brightness temperature different from LST? Um, yes, they both are different. LST is land surface temperature, and uh, brightness temperature is is usually derived from top of atmosphere radiance measurements. Uh, so when you have any radiation that's going to space, that's converted back to equivalent temperature of the surface atmosphere system. That's how generally it's defined. So it, uh, brightness temperature does not directly reflect LST. No. Can we use the KML file for the boundaries of the data which is to be downloaded? Um, if you're talking about G GES disk or um, Giovanni, I think um, once you download data, you can use KML file, but I'm not aware of um, ability to upload KML file. There, on Earth data, I think there is a way you can upload your shape file, ESRI shape file, to select your domain. And I think um, Appears also allows you to upload your, um, uh, upload a shape file to, to, to sort the boundaries. Does NSIDC require a separate account than NASA Earth data? So NSIDC is part of NASA's um, Distributed Archive Center. And so you can use the same Earth data account to access all uh, DACs. Question 22, are any of the SMAP products delivered as geotiffs? Uh, yes, through the Earth data website, you can opt to download the data as geotiffs and appears also allows you to download the data as geotiffs 
Question 23, can we use the softwares given on the site to read the HDF files for reading other HDF files rather than using it for only SMAP products? Yes, absolutely. The software will read any HDF file, file, HDF file not just SMAP HDF. Question 24, is it possible to access the SMAP data sets using an API? Um, yes, it is, and if you follow the link below, it, it um, indicates how to do that. Question 25, can we use SMAP for delineation of groundwater? And that's an interesting question. So SMAP is looking at the top five centimeters of the soil. So you're just looking at surface water. You're not getting into groundwater. Um, there's other data sets. There's a satellite called GRACE, which does get at indirectly at um, assessing uh, groundwater. Groundwater change, actually. Can extract values to points be generated on the net CDF format of the SMAP data sets? Can the points extracted be taken as soil moisture values? Um, I believe you can, yes. Question 27, what size of a farming operation would benefit from using these satellite data? And how are they using it? It seems to us the resolution and capabilities to cover very large areas and probably used for more regional analysis. What are the panelists' thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, SMAP has a nine kilometer um, resolution so a moisture product, and so if you're looking at small farms, uh, you, you're not really um, characterizing uh, small plots or small farms. So it's really more for um, larger agricultural fields, especially in industrialized countries, you have uh, larger fields and, and for regional analysis. But Amita, perhaps you want to talk about the products, the other products. No, you, you're right, actually. Uh, these products, because of the resolutions, that's the limitation that you, it, it, you can look at regional uh, variations, only not very small scale or variations or farm scale. But uh, you can use these data as input to either crop models or watershed models for looking at um, high resolution modeling, these data can work as forcing for that or boundary conditions for that. That's possible. Okay, the next question. Oh, Amita, uh, perhaps you can take that one, uh, question 28. Yeah. So, so how does the accuracy of ALDAS, ALDAS vary over different land covers? Um, we will point, we'll, we'll put some references here for you to look at uh, when we complete this question answer uh, sheet. But yes, it does vary with land cover, but I'm not sure whether it's easier to quantify over grassland. Um, I will have to come back and answer this question once I um, have looked at the correct answer because um, I think it has been validated for different land covers in different parts of the world also. So I haven't seen it mentioned somewhere that it's easier to quantify over grassland. Um, yes, co comparing the resolution, of, uh, con considering the resolution of the model, model, it seems reasonable that you have uniform land cover performance would be better. Accuracy would be better than uh, varying vegetation cover or you, if you have um, 
forests or woods which are subgrid scale smaller region that are not represented so i will have to go back and find some references for this so we will how are you yeah go ahead okay. so also uh, erica i, I think um, it, we're just about uh, noon now um, so you can uh, take the next a couple of questions about SMAP, and then what we will do is go through all the questions, remaining questions, um, and answer them online. And this document will be available from our set website, so you can go back and read the answers. Great. So I'll quickly go through the SMAP ones. How accurate is the SMAP time series for one pixel or a group of pixels? Would the accuracy and accuracy be relatively stable at each location? Yeah, so SMAP has a whole calibration validation effort to make sure that uh, if there are any biases in the instrument in time, those are corrected for. So it should be um, pretty consistent. Now, the accuracy for a single pixel is going to vary on the land cover for that pixel and how that land cover is changing. So every pixel value, every soil moisture value has an accuracy uh, associated with it. So even though there might be a retrieval, the accuracy might not meet the mission accuracy requirements. Um, I hope that's clear. So the mission accuracy requirements is, um, is up to a 4% error volume metric, okay? So in some areas, it's not gonna meet that because the vegetation is too dense, the water content in the vegetation is too high and that signal can't really um, get through the vegetation and um, detect uh, the, the soil moisture in the soil. Question 30, how does the instrument differentiate the depth of surface and root zone? So root zone, it, it's actually using a model. So that's a level four product that uses a model that takes the moisture at the surface from the observations and then through infiltration, through texture, land cover, a number of different ancillary parameters, determines what the moisture is at the root zone level, which is one meter down. Okay, so as far as I'm seeing, those are the ones directly related to SNAP. SNAP. Um, just a couple of more questions we can quickly look at. Question 32 is about, um, is the list publicly available for free? Yes, it is. Um, in the presentation, you will see the link to list, and we'll also po post it here. Um, you can you can customize it for your own region so software is available do you do you know of higher resolution model that is located in the tropics so as far as nasa models are concerned these are the models uh, high resolution model uh, highest resolution available is quarter degree even in tropics could smap data as well as LDAT products be used for irrigation scheduling or groundwater recharge for a specific area um, should be possible um, for uh, for ground yeah for, for irrigation scheduling over a over considerably large region you can because um, say LDAS is 25 kilometers in SMAP varies from 9 to 40 kilometers so maybe about that scale you can um, schedule uh, use it for irrigation scheduling uh, we will see in session four that et um, is available and that actually is used for monitoring uh, irrigation scheduling or scheduling when to actually irrigate um, so it should be possible for groundwater recharge, also same thing. Um, I guess depending on the resolution, you can use that. Does Giovanni allow you to download large amount of data through scripts? Um, I'm. I think for large download of data, you would use 
GAS disk. There is a way uh, to do the same thing if you, but you still have to have the list of files that you um, you got from Giovanni. They have lineage of which files are used. And based on that, it should be possible, but the easiest thing is to just use GES disk. Um, are all these products available in Google Earth Engine? Not all of them. No, I'm not sure about SMAP. I don't think LDAS is available. Yeah, SMAP, there is a, a version of SMAP. It's a, it's a quarter degree spatial resolution and it's been combined with um, uh, they're using a, a ensemble common filter data simulation approach. So if you want the, the, the original soil moisture product, you have to go to any, some of the websites that I showed you. The instruction to download using WGET for Windows OS does not download all files and timeout after a few files. Can you post the bulk download that works? Okay, we will have to revisit this question. I will check on that um, because since I do not use Windows, I have not encountered this. So we will get back to you on that. Another question, what Python libraries are generally recommended for use by consumers of data in NetCDF or HDF formats? Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific, I, I'm not familiar with exact which libraries. The version that personally we, I use is the Anaconda Python and that comes with these libraries. So we'll get back to you on that. How can we use FLDAS for food security? So you can see the example, this famine early warning network, it uses FLDAS. And you, we will, you will also see the link to FLDAS in the webinar, uh, in the presentation. You can go through that, how it is used for uh, food security. So basically it's for famine early warning. So that it allows you to plan if you have to get food from somewhere else, then what does unit of soil moisture kilograms per meter square mean? So this is in the LDAS. Uh, it is um, amount of, so mass of soil moisture in unit area, that's what it means. Will you cover shallow groundwater from LDAS assimilation? Not in this webinar, we're not going to cover that, but we are planning a, um, more advanced webinar in near future where you will calculate water budget and in that we will talk about uh, shallow groundwater. How can we compare the RS soil moisture with in situ data? So you will start with uh, remote sensing soil moisture such as from SMAP, uh, extract uh, data at a particular latitude longitude grid which has in situ data location within that grid and then you will just use Ideally, you will do this for for uh, some period, some time, and look at time series, and then any software can help you compare, so take bias or errors between the two. So we will go back and revisit some of the questions and post the question answer uh, sheet on the this document on the website. So we ask you to please refer to that later on. Um, and uh, next week, we're going to have a um, presentation by Sean McCartney about, uh, again, uh, using uh, some of these for uh, crop mapping. And so we will, we hope to see you next week. Thank you so very much. Uh, so on behalf of the RSET team, we thank you all for attending this webinar. We'll see you next week.